Hi there everyone, my name is Ben Ambrose and I'm the Managing Director at Medical Doorway. This presentation, which is about studying medicine, dentistry or veterinary medicine in Europe, is something we actually delivered in schools as well as at different exhibitions and careers counsellors events, but we have had increasing numbers of requests to make this a video, so people who've perhaps seen this presentation before can review it again, but also for uh, people, students, parents, careers, counsellors who've not had the chance to actually attend one of our events or see this presentation, so they've got the opportunity to review it. It's currently March 2016. Everything in this presentation is current as of, as of today. However, what you do need to bear in mind is regulations can change, so it's always important to refer back to our website, medicaldoorway.com, to keep up to date with the latest universities, different information about regulations, those kinds of things. Uh, so please do go ahead and use this presentation as a starting point for your research, but do go to our website as well as look at regulatory websites to make sure you're keeping up to date with the information that we're delivering in this presentation. So what we'll discuss is why study these subjects, medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine in Europe, and then we'll think about the opportunities that that presents, as well as some of the challenges you will face in terms of making an application and as well as enrolling and then studying as a medical student. There are some questions that you have to consider because this is not a kind of an easy route into medicine. There are many, many challenges you have to kind of negotiate in your uh, both application as well as your uh, studies in medicine. And that is just because it's in Europe doesn't mean it's any easier than perhaps it would be in, say, the UK, USA or kind of English language speaking countries. We're going to talk about the actual methods of applying to study medicine, dentistry or veterinary medicine in Europe, what to do, what not to do, very important to really look at things critically and how to plan ahead. And then consider what all the overall costs are in terms of studying and applying uh, to the different programmes that we are going to talk about today. We'll also talk about becoming an international medical student, the starting uh, position that you'll be in as an international medical student and then what to expect in your first few months of studies. Now, if we consider the, re the facts and the figures about studying medicine in Europe at the moment, what we've noticed is the actual demand by students to study medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine is always increasing. But unfortunately, the supply of places over a long period of time has actually been in decrease. And this is putting a huge amount of stress on the admission systems within domestic universities. And what previously students who would do who didn't secure a place on the medicine, dentistry or veterinary medicine program in their home country this being the UK for the most of the students that we deal with, the traditional alternatives have become less popular. So what most students usually would do is go on to study a degree like biomedical science, biochemistry or an allied health professions degree, and then try to get into medicine after they've graduated, either as a graduate for the graduate entry programmes or straight into the standard six-year medical, five or six-year medical programmes again. This is now much less popular with the increase of fees in the UK to £9,000 and the obviously increased living costs of being a student over that three-year uh, say biomedical science degree, often about student debts can be in the region of fifty to fifty five thousand pounds after graduation. So for many students, they're not really it's not viable for them to actually uh, to rack up a debt of that level if they're actually really wanting to pursue medical studies after graduation. So what many students have actually started to do is if they don't get into their program of choice in their home country, is then look at the European Economic Area as an option. All of the universities that we're talking about today, all are taught in English, all the programmes are assessed in English, and actually, they're from a regulatory perspective, they are recognised across the European economic area. So they are a viable and increasingly popular option to consider. Now, while this presentation is predominantly aimed at students from the United Kingdom, the same rules apply uh, to any student who's in a country where the supply of seats in medical education is much, much lower than the demand. Uh, and provided actually you have a European Union passport, your qualification, if it's achieved in the European Economic Area, is recognised across Europe. This means there are a huge number of opportunities and an increasing number of opportunities in Europe to study these programmes, but you do have to adopt a critical, uh, critical approach both to the application and the choices of your universities because there are a number of challenges you're going to have to consider. One obviously being the fact that you'll be away from home, but we'll discuss those as we go through the presentation. So if we just look at the HESA data for the moment, and we look at applications to UK medical programmes over the last, say, 2007-2014, which is the, the data that's most available at the moment, 
Back in 2007, we were going to see that there were just over 72,000, around about 72,000 applications to say to study medicine. By 2014, with the increase in tuition fees to £9,000 and obviously the increase in popularity of medical studies, that's now increased to nearly 85,000 applications. So there's been a steady, steady increase over that period of time of people wanting to pursue medical education for an eventual career as a doctor. If we just look, what, however, what's happened to the number of places, the numbers of places in uh, medical programmes has actually reduced from around about 7,300 in 2007. We did have a slight increase for a few years, but it has now gone down to around about 6,800 in 2014. So as well as the increase in numbers of applications, what we're seeing is a reduction in the number of students actually accepted into UK medical programmes. Now, this is basically meaning roughly 92% of applicants who apply to UK medical programmes don't receive an offer to study. So they those students have got very little opportunity really to consider after after that rejection they can either take a gap year which is a very good option for many many students because it gives them the time to develop their profile to consider the other options open to them as well as obviously if they need to look at their academics to start to upskill themselves in their chemistry biology their sciences the other option was obviously as we've discussed before to study an alternative degree but that is becoming less popular and thirdly, where we come in is the opportunity to study these programmes outside of the UK in Europe. So if you just look at the information that was published at the end of February 2016, there is the NHS in the United Kingdom is experiencing a significant vacancy rate for doctors and nurses in a variety of health professions. And the I just circled it in red just there. Currently at the moment, based on the information that was on the BBC, there are 6,207 doctor vacancies within the UK. Now, this isn't necessarily just doctors at the FY1 or FY2 level. This is across the board. So some of these vacancies are going to be at the higher levels, which obviously, which you've graduated, you won't be going straight into. But basically what we're looking at here is a significant number of vacancies at the same time as a reduction in the number of training places. Now, this is going to take some time to turn around from either in, from uh, employing doctors trained overseas or increasing the numbers of places training at university in the UK. But uh, roughly 70% of hospitals within the United Kingdom are actually trying to recruit uh, abroad for doctors or nurses. So having, being, a, being a, say, a British student or a native English speaker, having a qualification which you can bring into the uh, UK from a university across Europe does actually, based on these statistics, make you very employable. So like I said, if you do go on to study these programmes, you actually get the opportunity to study the programme and access the career that you've aspired to for such a long period of time. No one really wakes up one morning just before application deadline dates and decides they can be a, they want to be a doctor or a dentist. They actually something that they think about over a number of years uh, in, the, in the lead up to them choosing a particular career or a method or a, a degree of study. As it, as it is today, in 2016, EEA citizens from a state-regulated programme within the European Economic Area are eligible to register with the GMC without sitting the PLAV exam. There is actually, however, one requirement. Because when you actually work in the clinical environment on this degree in Europe, you'll be communicating in a language other than English, and we'll talk about that in a short while, you will have to take an IELTS test to prove that you can speak English. And obviously, for a native English speaker, this isn't at all a concern. What you do have to be aware of, though, is the GMC is looking at changing medical regulation or the access to the, the, uh, the license to practice in the United Kingdom. And all students will be in a position where they have to sit something called the UK Medical Licensing Assessment before they actually register as a doctor. Now, based on the information that the GMC is producing at the moment or, or and the literature that is coming out of the GMC, this is going to be something which is applicable to all students, even if you've graduated from a UK university. So regardless of if you graduated in the UK or Europe, you will still have to take this assessment. And, and we're expecting that to actually take hold for students graduating any time between 2019 and the early 2020s. If you study medicine in Europe, you will develop a whole range of skills at the same time as developing your skills as a medical student and eventually a medical doctor. You will be studying with students from all over the world. You'll be living in another country. So you will develop a range of intercultural skills, which actually will give you an extra kind of uh, extra set of skills to apply in the, in the clinical environment. And studying overseas does build you, it does change you. It gives you a great uh, additional uh, kind of string to your bow. Uh, in terms of dealing with a much more multi, a much more multi-ethnic and diverse community within the UK. 
One of the other opportunities overall is that the fees and living costs can be much lower than in the United Kingdom. It's not always the case, different universities have different fee levels, but you can actually save some money in terms of the actual tuition fees as well as the living costs, especially the living costs than you necessarily would do if you studied in the UK. Now, as I said, there is currently a shortfall of trained doctors in the UK based on the information that we took from the BBC. And there is an increasing demand for doctors in developed economies all over the world as we tackle with the issues of an aging population, but also increasing uh, increasing ages, increasing uh, numbers of the population that are living with uh, the diseases of civilization that are caused largely by uh, the way that we organize our societies now. In terms of challenges, you do have to bear in mind that you will be making a long-term commitment to actually studying outside of your home country. It's not permanent, but it will be six years. So if you're leaving school now as an 18-year-old, you will be graduating as a fully qualified doctor when you're in your mid-20s. And that is obviously going to change you quite significantly. It's something that you need to bear in mind if you're thinking about this as a potential opportunity for you to study medicine. I discussed that it's far financially cheaper often to study, but loan availability and scholarship and grant availability is limited. The vast majority of students do have to self-fund themselves through their degree, both in terms of tuition fees and the living costs. And it is very important to budget appropriately. And if this is something which is perhaps two or three years away for you, it's very important to start planning for this now because any... any uh, any financial commitments you're going to make or any difficulties would affect your studies. There are many, many cultural differences to studying at an international university than perhaps studying in the UK. You have to get used to a new system of working, different learning hours, perhaps a lot more face-to-face -face contact than perhaps you would expect to get in a British university. Don't expect the universities across Europe to have exclusively PBL approaches to education, especially in those first two years where the focus is going to be a lot more on the basic sciences before you actually start some of the clinical work that you'll be actually uh, studying. And working towards. There are different social norms, different, expe different expectations in many universities. There's a much more formal approach to education rather than the much more liberal approach to education that we perhaps have in the United Kingdom. Now, while all the programmes that we are talking about today are taught in English, assessed in English, you do have to learn a new language while you're studying. Now, you are taught in that in the vast majority of universities, up to six hours a week for the first three years. And this is because when you start the clinical work, and especially when you do your final, your sixth year, the internship year, which from a UK perspective is the equivalent of FY1, you will actually be communicating with patients in their local language. While the vast majority of young people, the students on the domestic programmes and the young people you'll meet around, the place you're studying in, will actually speak English. You can't expect the older generations, i.e. the generations that tend to populate hospitals, to be able to speak English fluently or even speak English at all. So you will be communicating with them in their own language. Now, this can actually be a challenge or it can be an opportunity. It depends how you look at it. But this is something you do have to sign up to if you're pursuing medicine in Europe. Now, we talked recently, just in the last slide, about the shortfall of doctors and the, the opportunities for employability. But things can change over a six-year period. So the situation when you're entering your degree may be different in six years' time. No one can predict what that future will bring. So while the situation, especially in the UK, may be quite buoyant at the moment, it may be different in six years' time. So do keep your options open in terms of what you may be, where you may be considering to go to work as a doctor after you've graduated. So as it stands now, 2016, <clears throat> EEA citizens can graduate uh, from an EEA programme and they're exempt from the PLAB. But as we discussed, the UK Medical Licensing Assessment is something which is coming in for all graduates in the years to come. And the same rule roughly applies for dentistry and veterinary medicine, where you're actually eligible to bring your qualification back to the United Kingdom. And in dentistry, you're currently exempt from the Dental Foundation training, which used to be known as uh, the uh, VT1. So really, what you've got to consider is, do you really want to be a doctor, dentist or vet? For most of the students who come and talk to us, this is something we talk about in quite a lot of depth because medicine is a hard subject wherever you decide to go. And many of the universities we're going to discuss shortly are actually internationally recognised, very prestigious universities that have a high level of academic uh, requirements and uh, expect a lot from you as a student. It's no easier to study medicine in Europe. That's the one thing I want to get across. It can be harder because as well as living away from home, as well as studying medicine, as well as studying a new language, you're having to grapple with all of the different uh, changes in culture, 
the different ways of working, all of these kinds of things, which are all going to have an impact. So you've really got to want to study medicine. You've got to want that career at the end of it if you're going to excel on these programs. Can you manage to be away from home? Medical science, as I say at the bottom here, are not learned in isolation. You'll be studying alongside students from all over the world. You're going to have to build new support networks, multicultural, multilingual support networks, which actually will benefit you in your future career. But that's something you have to actually go out and seek. And the first semester is often the hardest because the volume of work can be significant, as well as the time you're going to take to adapt and learn to a new way of working and to a new culture. So once you've decided this is for you, you have to consider which universities will be the right options. And it's important to say that because a university is in Europe, it doesn't mean it's equally ranked or equally regarded. A medical degree from Europe is not just like a medical degree. While all the programmes are recognised in the United Kingdom, that doesn't necessarily mean employers will look at all of the programmes equally. There is no central, central application system, so unlike in the UK with UCAS, you can't apply through one portal to a range of universities across Europe. Generally, you have to identify which universities you want to apply to, and through Medical Door, where you can apply to those universities directly. So we work with a whole range of uh, EEA medical programmes, and we know these universities, we're appointed by these universities to work on their behalf. We have established relationships with the staff, admission staff, as well as the academic staff, and all of the team who work at Medical Doorway are international HE specialists. And we actually have students, hundreds of students now, which are enrolling at these universities. And lastly, we're free of charge, and I'll talk a little bit about what to do and what not to do later in this presentation. But regardless of what we say in this presentation or information you find out at our website or on university website, it's very important to do your independent research. You're going to be the one signing up to study here at this university for six years' time. You need to know all about it. And that may be including doing a site visit, visiting the university, going on an open day, speaking to us, searching what you can find in the different forums on the internet. But it's really important to take a critical approach to online information because what we've found is there's a lot of information out there, much of which is unsubstantiated, unverifiable. So it's very important rather to take a very critical approach to what you read before you actually make the decision to apply to a university. So let's look at some of the universities in Europe which are going to be options for you to consider. And we'll do them in different country, uh, country kind of groups. So we're going to start off in one of the more popular options, and this is the Czech Republic. And obviously this university itself needs very little introduction. It's one of the faculties of Charles University. Now, Charles University is a bit like an Oxford and Cambridge institution in that it has multiple faculties under the banner of Charles University. Oxford has multiple colleges, but the same with Cambridge, Charles will have multiple faculties. Now, we work with the first faculty of medicine uh, in the Czech Republic, which is one of the 15 oldest medical schools in the world. And Charles University is considered in the top 1.5% of universities in the world. So this is a really prestigious institution. Obviously in the centre of the capital of the Czech Republic it makes it a very popular option for students and it is linked to some exceptional hospitals as well. So you will be getting a top level of education from Charles University. Tuition fees roughly in the region of €12,000 a year at the moment but they charge in the local currency so that can change depending on the exchange rate. So keep an eye on our website medicaldoorway.com uh, to keep an eye on what those tuition fees are when you're deciding to apply. We're going to stay in the Czech Republic, but we're going to move to the south and we're going to look at Palatsky University. Again, one of the oldest universities in the Czech Republic. This university has been educating students since the late 1500s. The Faculty of Medicine is world renowned, very high levels of, high, very high levels of, of research output. And the surgeon who led the USA's first full face transplant, Dr. Bodan Pomerhatch, is a graduate of this university. Tuition fees and living costs tend to be a bit lower than Prague simply because it's not in the capital. You're looking at €10,000 a year to study here and the living costs are, are roughly around about 40% lower than you would get necessarily in Prague. Staying in the Czech Republic, we're going to move slightly west. This is Masaryk University in the second city of Brno. And again, a, a fantastic faculty uh, in a kind of purpose-built camp medical campus right next to the hospital. One of the cheaper options in the Czech Republic would tend to work out around about nine and a half thousand euros. Going back uh, up north again, and again, one of the other faculties at Charles University. So this is actually in the city of Haradic Kralova. Uh, and again, this institution, very famous for its role in cardiac surgery. And again, in the Czech Republic, you can generally count on getting world-class education from universities that are research intensive. 
for those students that want to study veterinary medicine, you can't go far wrong really than looking at the University of Veterinary and Pharmaceutical Sciences, again, in the second city of Bernau. It is a purpose-built campus around about 20 minute walk directly from the, from the city centre with exceptional accommodation offerings for students as well. They've got a large animal hospital on site, an equine centre on site, a small animal hospital on site, a centre for tropical bird uh, uh, treatment on site. So it's got everything in one area and an extremely popular university in Europe uh, for veterinary medicine. And it's at 7,600 euros for the six year program. It's a very popular option for many students who are looking at going into veterinary medicine. We're going to stay in, um, we'll go a bit more Eastern Europe, I should say, and we're going to talk, talk about the University of Debrecen in Hungary. Again, one of the most popular universities in Europe for medicine and one which is one of the most prestigious. And that building you're seeing in front of you is actually part of the, uh, the university where some of the medical lectures are actually uh, are performed. And it is an exceptionally popular university for students with very, relatively large enrolments. And not just popular for British students as well. There are students from all over the world, including the USA, from uh, West Africa, from East Africa, from Asia, especially South Korea. There's actually a South Korean block of accommodation because it is that popular with students from South Korea. And you are going to get world-class facilities in a large campus community with accommodation on site and sports centres on site. If you want a uni campus university environment, which is perhaps more similar to what you would find on the campus universities in the UK or the USA, this would be the option to consider. One of the most op popular options actually in Bulgaria, uh, and the, well, the most popular option in Bulgaria and in Europe is Pleven Medical University. Pleven is the university that I've been teaching medicine in English the longest. They started teaching medicine in English in 1997 and is exceptionally popular with students from all over the world. This a university is quite unique in that it has a February enrolment. So for many students who are perhaps coming to this later into the academic year, there is an option actually to study medicine in Bulgaria rather uh, more or less uh, after you've qualified from school rather than wait a full 12 months uh, for uh, taking a gap year, etc. One of the benefits here is it's one of the cheapest options to study medicine in Europe but still get a high quality level of education. 7,000 euros a year to, will get you an option of studying medicine at uh, Medical University Pleven. In addition to the lower tuition fees, you are getting some exceptional facilities in many areas of the university, including a special center for telecommunicative endoscopic surgery, which is an option if you want to go and study after, as a postgraduate. We're actually going to move outside of that part of South and Eastern Europe now. We're going to move towards the Baltics. Riga Stradin University in Latvia. This university is more modern. It's been around since the 1970s and is increasingly popular for many, many students, especially from Scandinavia, as well as Germany and the UK. This university has two enrolment points in the year, one in September and one in February. And actually that makes it extremely popular because for many students, they can actually apply for the university in their home country. But then if they don't get made an offer at results day, can apply for the uh, February enrollment. And they have relatively large enrollments and some of the best facilities, especially in dentistry, that you're gonna find anywhere in Europe. The Lithuanian University of Health Sciences, in the uh, old capital of Lithuania, Kaunas. This is the only university in Europe that has dentistry, medicine, and veterinary medicine under one roof, all taught in English. And that is making it increasingly popular for students because it is uh, not as popular as it has, as say some of the Czech universities have been, but in coming increasingly popular. And uh, it uh, benefits from relatively low tuition fees, as well as exceptionally low costs of living. Now, for those students who've perhaps studied a degree first, uh, like biomedical sciences, and want to actually really do a, a graduate entry uh, option, Poznan University of Medical Sciences in Poland. This is a university in, as I said, in the city of Poznan, which is in western Poland towards the German border. Uh, offer a four-year graduate entry route with an option to then do the USMLE if you want to study in the USA. So a very popular option for students who are perhaps po uh, graduates from biomedical science or biochemistry degrees to actually go and do their medical degree in a four-year period. And for those students who are considering studying dentistry but want to stay in Western Europe, Feu San Pablo in Madrid is an extremely popular option. But because it's so popular, you really do have to get your application in by November, December of the year before you are planning to apply uh, to enrol. So now we've looked at over the, some of the universities, let's consider the methods of application. Because as I said before, there is no... UCAS, there is no central application system and different universities in different countries have different 
uh, procedures and processes that you have to go through. So the first thing to do is get in contact with us either or via our website or medicaldoorway.com or uh, email us at hello at medicaldoorway.com and we can actually go through your overall profile, give you the chance to ask specific questions about the fees, the admissions procedures, those kinds of things and determine if you'd be appropriate for entry or appropriate to go and study at some of these universities that we work with. Once you've decided on that, we'll help you arrange your application. If there are entrance exams, which there are for many of the universities, we can help you support you to get onto those entrance exams. And we run those entrance exams in the UK, Ireland, and increasingly in other parts of the world as well. Uh, and before you actually go out to the universities, we're able to offer pre-departure support, either remotely or via our pre-departure briefings, which are becoming increasingly popular for many students now. And at the final stage, in most of the universities that you may enrol at, our team is on site when you arrive to help you get settled with your accommodation, to get you uh, sorted with your bank accounts and to start you at your enrolment procedures at the university. And like I said, again, that service is free of charge. Now, what not to do? Unfortunately, because of what I said before about the numbers of applications and the numbers of places now reducing, we're finding a lot of these fee charging agents are out there asking for quite large agency fees to deliver relatively little. So what we would advise you to do when you're doing your research, if you do come across an agency asking for one, two, three, often more, uh, £1,000, often more than that, please do not hand over your money. That kind of money is going to be much more useful to spend on your tuition fees and your living costs than sitting in the bank accounts of some of these fee charging agents. We have found lots of websites usually linked to these fee charging agents that want to claim to help you guarantee entry, these kinds of things. And what we found is the information across these websites is conflicting. Lots of unverifiable and unsubstantiated claims are made there simply for the purpose of getting you to part with your money. On the anonymous forums that we found, uh, we found friendly fellow students appear uh, able to help you. Often these aren't genuine, okay? We know what the programs are like in these universities and a busy medical student simply will not have the time out uh, with the amount of study they're doing to help you apply to university. They're gonna be more concerned with their own studies, their own actual uh, passing the exams so they actually do become doctors. So what we generally say is to be very critical of what you read online. And once anyone starts to ask for the thousands of pounds in agency fees, etc., please don't part with that money. You can use that money for much uh, better purposes. However, our service is free of charge, but what does it cost? Most universities, not all, will have an application fee of some kind. It can be anything from 50 pounds up to 350 pounds, depending on the institution. Some universities will charge an entrance exam fee, and if that's sat in the UK, you can pay that to us to run the entrance exams here. And again, that can be from £50 upwards to £100 uh, to £200, pounds, depending on the institution that you are applying to. Once you've actually accepted a place to actually go and study, often you do need to legalise documents in some way or another. There are different levels of legalisation, so you need to bear that in mind, that if you accept a place, you often have to bear the cost of doing some legal work. And that can come from around about £80 for the basic levels of legalisation, up to £400, where you need to legalise quite a lot of documents and also have them legalised by the UK Foreign Office or the Foreign Office in your uh, local country, if you're an APA style uh, signatory. Very rare now, but for some universities, you do need to translate documents into the local language from English uh, into the local language. It is becoming less, less common to do this now, but still required for one or two places. And generally, you need to budget for around about £150 for that. So that would be what the total cost would be of applying and getting your documents ready to actually uh, enrol at a university. If you are made an offer for an institution, much of the, often you have to pay a deposit of the first semester fees. That will actually secure your place at the university. So if you do get accepted, you do often have to make that commitment. And in the vast majority of cases, this deposit is removed from the first semester fees or the first year fees for the university that you've applied to go to. So you've decided which universities perhaps, or you want to look at the application system for different universities, write down on a list the step-by-step -step application procedures that you go through because there might be different things that you have to do in different different times. They can vary by country and even universities in the same countries can often vary what they require from you. So it's really important to plan in advance. And think, are you actually ready to apply to the particular university? Some universities may require you to have all your exam results before you're actually gonna have them. Some will require other documents that perhaps are gonna take some time to get together. 
make sure you've got those application those, those documents to hand and make sure you're ready for stepping onto the different application procedures and processes that those universities require you to do. Determine your first, your second, your third choice. It's good to have more than one option to apply to. And as I said, we work with a range of universities all across Europe. And it's good to actually spread your spread yourself so actually you're not you know, you're not got all your eggs in one basket in terms of the university you're going to go to. But don't apply to four, five, six universities because the reality will be if you're appropriate for medicine, you will get an offer from either one, two or three or maybe from all of those institutions. So applying to four or five or six universities will simply increase the amount you're actually spending on applications when really you don't need to do that. So what I can say is if you plan ahead, get into the application cycle. Universities in Hungary, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, they have entrance exams. Now look at the dates for the entrance exams and if we're running them in uh, London, Manchester or Dublin or other countries increasingly so, make sure you're applying in advance for those entrance exams so you can secure receipts or if you decide to go to the university itself, look at when those entrance exams are so you can plan your diary appropriately. So as I said, make sure your documents are ready. And this is not just for the application, but if you're accepting a place afterwards, you need to have documents ready and appropriately de uh, dealt with, appropriately treated in order to secure your place. And delays have actually uh, resulted in lost places. When there's an entrance exam, look at what the learning material suggests you need to learn for that entrance exam. On our website, for the Czech exams, we have a question bank for the Czech exams. At the moment, there are over 200 questions on there, and they'll help you prepare for that entrance exam. And the entrance exams can vary from university to university, so make sure you do get the learning materials, do prepare for that exam, because sometimes some of the questions may not be covered by your A-level or uh, IB certificate uh, curriculum. Think about what you might be asked. After the entrance exams, often there's an interview, and that is the case for the Hungarian universities as well as the Czech universities. Some of those questions will be on the basic sciences, in addition to why you want to study medicine, the kind of more uh, uh, aptitude aspects of the interview. So be prepared for that, because when you're actually studying medicine in Europe, many of the exams will actually be oral exams. Okay, Make sure you're able to say why you're... Uh, able to study abroad, how you're prepared for the challenges of studying abroad at the institution that you're going to go to. And we always advise if you're going to go into an exam with some with a, a professor from a Hungarian university or a Czech university, be able to say hello and thank you in their language. You can look at how to do that on YouTube very quickly and learn those, those basic words. That shows an interest in their country, in their town, in the university. And those first impressions do matter. So if you're a borderline candidate when it comes to the entrance exam, you can secure your place by showing an interest in the university because it shows you're actually going out of your way to uh, ensure that you're uh, going to be appropriate for studying abroad, for studying medicine, as well as for studying at that particular university in that particular country. So, if you pass the exam, if there is one, or you've sent your documents off and you've got an offer, what do you do? Well, it's always advisable, and we advise, to do an early visit of that institution to make sure you're going to be happy in the environment so the first time you arrive in that institution or that your town is not the time you're going to enrol and if you want us to help we can help arrange visits appointments with the different staff and students in the universities to help you uh, get, get acclimatized to your uh, to your environment you will have to obviously arrange accommodation and many of the universities we work with have their own accommodation however some don't and we help you with that from start to finish for European students, you are going to need some form of health insurance. And for any student, actually, you will need some form of health insurance. But for Europeans, that's free and it's covered by the European Health Insurance Card. But you may want to consider private health insurance. And most of the universities have links with private insurers to actually provide health insurance. And that can be much cheaper than you'd expect than if you took similar insurance in the UK or, say, the USA. If you're a non-European Union student, you will need to have this private health insurance to be able to apply for a visa. And to note there for non-EU students, it is important to start your process very early because you will need to apply for a visa and that can take three to six months depending on your nationality as well as the country you're applying to. And if, for example, you do want to ship your belongings out, we can recommend international shipping companies if you're determined to take quite a lot out with you rather than just what you can perhaps carry on your flight. 
So when you've accepted university and you've gone out, the first thing to do is arrive in the town. Secondly, get find your accommodation, get moved in. And very quickly, you need to find your way around the town. Find the shops which are going to sell the products that you want to buy. Let's say, for example, you've got certain dietary requirements for uh, medical or religious reasons. Make sure you find the shops and the services where you can uh, get those, those goods. Find out the local restaurants that you're going to want to eat in and where the other students eat in. And then, you know, that is an often good way to find and get to lower local people to practice the language. And obviously, to find out which buildings you're going to be required to go to in the university and find out where they are quite early on. Because some of the institutions, you might have lectures in different parts of the town rather than in just one campus. It's always really good to get involved in interest groups or societies, sporting groups, and try to mix with the local students. Like I said, you will be studying the local language while you're studying this program. The best way of learning a language is to use it from the start and get used to using it. And getting to know the local students will help you in that process. And I said, get to know your local environment, get to know the local sites, determine where you're going to go. If you're going to take some time out of your studies, the kind of things you're going to get involved in. It's very important to do that because ultimately, if you're just working and not giving yourself time away from the books and balancing that time appropriately, you might perhaps not be doing as well as you perhaps could do on your studies. And get used to that environment in that first week. Enjoy that first week because you will then, from when the course starts, have to put a lot of work in, especially in those first semester, to get used to the level of, uh, of getting used to expectations and the level of knowledge and skills that the university is going to require of you. So there is a lot more, lots more information on our website, medicaldoorway.com. You can always drop us an email, hello at medicaldoorway.com. Myself or one of my team will get back to you very quickly. Alternatively, you can give our UK office a call. We're up in Newcastle under Lyme in Staffordshire. That's our direct office number. If no one's in the office, it will go through to one of the team's mobile phone numbers, regardless of where we are in the world. So we will be able to answer your queries. Like I said, Drop us an email, ask us any question you want at all, okay? Any question at all, because if it's something which you're thinking about, it can be instrumental in finding the right university or giving you the right advice. Alternatively, if you're a school and you want us to come in and talk to you, talk to your students or colleagues, please drop us an email. We're very happy to do that and we do it all the time. But apart from that, we wish you all the best with your studies and making your applications and hopefully we'll help you pursue your academic dreams and become a doctor, dentist or better.